Welcome to the putback on SNY.TV. I'm Ian Begley, NBA insider, here with Stefan Bondi, Jonathan Macri. We're going to talk a lot of Knicks right now. We're going to talk about last night with Jalen Brunson. We're going to talk about today with Obi Toppin. We're going to talk about the coming weeks, getting closer to the trade deadline. As you guys know, Knicks 11 and 5 since going to that nine man rotation. Jalen Brunson. Monster night against the Spurs, tied his regular season or set his regular season career high with 38 points. Today, Obi Toppin practicing with the Westchester Knicks and traveling with the team to Toronto. And Steph, the Knicks are going to have an interesting decision to make Tom Thibodeau specifically once Toppin gets healthy enough to get back into the rotation because they've had success with this nine-man rotation. Uh, alluded to the 11-5 record. The numbers are really good, net rating, defensive rating, offensive rating, all that. And now you're going to have to reintegrate Obi Toppin into the rotation. Tom Thibodeau, you know, we've covered him for a couple of years, Steph, and just listening to him last night talking about it, uh, it, it sounded like there wasn't uh, like a, a set plan in place where Obi Toppin's coming in and getting 20 minutes a night. It seems like it's going to be a little bit fluid. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think he found something with his nine-man rotation, and he's not going to change that. Like, I, I, I don't envision him going to 10 men just because Obi Toppin's coming back. And Obi Toppin was part of the original nine-man rotation. Um, and part of the part of the deal with the rotation is that Julius Randle is playing more minutes and he's doing it very successfully. So, you know, I, I envision, and, and Thibodeau said yesterday, Toppin is going to play when he comes back. And when he, he's ramping up right now, he actually practiced with the Westchester Knicks and, and he's going to fly with the team to Toronto. He's going to play when he comes back, but I don't think there's going to be a ton of minutes there for him uh, as Julius Randle's backup. And there's going to have to be a decision made from Tom Thibodeau, either take out Jericho Sims or Isaiah Hartenstein. Jonathan, if you're Thibodeau, you're holding the clipboard, you're doing the rotations, what are you doing with Obi Toppin and how are you working him into the rotation? Well, I, I better make my voice more more hoarse if I'm going to try <laughs> to play that role. Um, I, I think Steph nailed it. I, I think, um, look, the nine-man rotation works, but uh, the fact is that, you know, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for them to slot Obi in and to expand it to 10 men because he's, you know, I don't ex expect we're going to see him play a whole lot of small forwards. So it makes sense that one of Hardenstein or, or Sims is going to go out. I mean, I think the reality is for as well as they've played um, with the nine man rotation. And even if you want to go back further to when it, it became the current starting lineup, um, top in, is a necessary piece of their success. They haven't been able to score very well uh, off the bench with him not there. And I'm, I don't think he's going to correct that all by himself, but his three point shot was really a serious thing for the first 20, 25 games of this year. I expect he'll get back to a level of proficiency there. And that I think helps them more than the offensive rebounding advantages, perhaps that come with the double big lineup. So I think it's, it's kind of an easy swap. I know a lot of fans would rather see, Hardenstein go to the bench instead of Sims. I think there's an interesting conversation to be had there. But, yeah, for Obi to come back in for 15 minutes a night is, is fine. Yeah, you talk about Hardenstein and, and Sims. And, you know, Tom Thibodeau, he's shown you, at least lately, that he's not going to hesitate to put big money players on the bench. Evan Fournier, Derek Rose, both making a lot of money. Both had been mostly out of the rotation, came back in recently due to injury. So I think if, if it makes basketball sense for Thibodeau, he's going to put Hartenstein on the bench without regards to the amount of money he's making. Now, I know that Thibodeau uh, was a big Hartenstein fan in the summer. So I think he was a big proponent of signing Hartenstein, and maybe that will lead him to a certain direction and bring Obi Toppin back. But you know, he's not worried about money and how it looks, how – the front office looks if he's putting all this money on the bench. And it, the interesting thing to me, too, is like, you know, there's going to be a lot of trade rumors right over the next few weeks. And you're going to see, I think, Obi Toppin's name pop up here and there. I think there's some teams that have interest. But I think teams, you know, if they're going to trade for a player, they want to see him play. They're not going to want to see him uh, on the end of the bench and try to guess at what he can be uh, if they trade for him. They want to see tape of that player uh, and they want to see it in, in the recent game. So, you know, Toppin, he's going to get minutes, and I think a lot of teams around the league are going to be keeping a close eye on those minutes once he gets back to the floor. Uh, and, Steph, I, I wonder for you, if you're looking at this thing big picture, 
can this work? I mean, I always come back to this. How can this work with Toppin and Randall? Or does Julius just continue to get uh, big, big minutes like he has been and, and you work Toppin in around that? Yeah, I mean, this was a – listen, the Knicks, when they drafted Obi Toppin, they had no idea that they had this good of a player in Julius Randle. Yes. Um, and it's been a problem ever since. I mean, let's face it. You don't you don't take a power forward, a power forward who's one of the oldest people in the draft, who was more supposedly more ready made than all the other draft picks. You don't take you don't take him um, if you think that you have your power forward that you're going to sign to a four year extension a year later. So listen, I, I don't think there's a good answer to this. I know people have said, well, you play um, Julius at center. Thibodeau doesn't want to do that. I don't think he's ever going to do that for extended minutes. Um, and it's a it's an issue because Obi Toppin is eligible for an extension after this before next season, um, and there really is no answer to this conundrum other than try to trade one of them. Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see. You mentioned it. Player teams are going to want to see Obi Toppin on the floor if they're going to be interested in trading for him. And and on that note, I think the other interesting part and in this can be said for any of the last two and a half years it's the weird part is it's not just about seeing Obi Toppin on the floor it's about seeing what Obi Toppin can do in the sort of offensive system especially that he was drafted I think to play in which is not really how they've ever used him from the moment they drafted him they kind of have been trying to convert him into more of this you know stretch four who stands out, you know, in the corner or, or behind the arc. And to his credit, he's, he's adjusted his skill set to fit that desire. But it, what's still interesting to me is if you're a team that is going to pay a real price to, to obtain him, barring some drastic change in their usage of him, you're still going to have to kind of imagine something that we haven't really seen at the pro level as far as him really having space as a dive man and, you know, being a, you know, coming off a lot of high pick and rolls and things of that nature. It's it's interesting, guys, because uh, I don't know, like specifically, that this was the set in stone plan. But teams in touch with the Knicks around the time when they drafted Obi Toppin, and then the weeks after that, leading up to you know that training camp, they were under the impression that the Knicks, you know, were going to look to trade Julius Randle that year, and Obi Toppin was then, you know, going to be their featured power forward. Obviously, Julius Randle changed all those plans with that All NBA season that he had. And the Knicks have kind of been stuck in this, uh, I would say, less than ideal spot in terms of fit. Since then, uh, does it come to a head here? Do, do, do the Knicks seriously look at trading Obi Toppin? Um, I think Jonathan gave good perspective on that and what the what the potential bring back would be. I, I would assume the teams would call about Obi. And again, uh, I think how he plays once he comes back here uh, will give you a good idea of what teams would give the Knicks back in a potential top and trade. Not sure where the Knicks are on it, but uh, but I think they'll get calls. And it's going to be interesting to see how it goes because you talk about stuff players, want, or, or I should say teams looking at players to trade for and, and wanting to see them on the floor. Uh, Cam Reddish is a player who is obviously going to be available here, and he has not seen the floor with Tom Thibodeau. And I don't know. I mean, I guess if there's a bunch of injuries, I think he would see the floor. But there's no indication at all that he even is going to see garbage time minutes uh, over these next couple of weeks unless something changes. And it's just interesting. The whole thing interests me in terms of going back to the trade to now and how it all has worked out. What's your sense on Reddish and the Knicks and where they are now? Um, in terms of trade, well, first of all, let's get this out of the way. They're not going to get back what they traded for them. They, I think they were the only team willing to give up a first round pick for Cam Reddish from, from the Atlanta Hawks and his value has only gone down since then. Um, I, I think there's something going on with, with Thibodeau and Cam Reddish that I don't, I, I don't feel comfortable, um, putting out there just cause I'm not, um, totally confirmed it, but I don't, I don't envision a situation where uh, Cam Reddish is going to be playing um, with this team moving forward. Um, you know, maybe, you know, like you said, injuries happen and, and then he might be thrust into the rotation. But you see situations where it's garbage time and Svee and Ryan Archie, Archie Diacono are playing and Cam Reddish has stayed on the bench. Um, I know I, I did report that uh, the Knicks and Cam Reddish's representatives have been working on a trade. Um, 
And I think that that is going to be the course that they're going to go. I think their best case scenario, though, I mean, maybe they can recoup a second round pick, the second round pick, kind of second round pick that they lost in the Jalen Brunson um, tampering investigation thing. Um, but I think their best their best course of action is to package Cam Reddish with other players and, and try to work something out that way. Jonathan, what are your thoughts on the whole situation from the trade to now? Um, well, from the original trade when they got him, it I, I even take it back a step earlier, which is that that pick that they gave up for Cam Reddish, I don't even think that's a pick they ever really wanted. It, it seemed like they were in a situation where they had two picks within two spots of each other in the draft, and they didn't want to roster two rookies. Um, you know, and that led to them trading that pick for the Hornets pick, which then turned into Cam. Because, again, I don't think they ever really valued the Hornets pick all that much. I think their backs were against the wall and they made the best deal they could. Uh, as for Cam, I mean, I compared it on my podcast last week to like it's a couple that has a long term lease that they have like two or three months left on the lease and they broke up. And it's just about getting to the end of the lease at this point. <laughs> um, I, I don't know whose name is on the lease. I guess it's it would be Tom. Uh, in any case, I mean, if you could get a pick that has a chance to end up in the 40s, I, you know, great. Uh, otherwise, like Steph said, is there a way that he can be kind of a uh, a way to grease the skids on a larger a larger deal where you're you're actually getting back something you want? But I, you know, who knows what sorts of of trades are out there. Look, I think if they get a pick back in the 40s, I mean, some people might say, all right, you wash your hands of it. But you look at it organizationally and you would have to question the process, I think, just from an outsider looking in. I know maybe that they didn't we didn't have designs on using that pick for a player, but you could have used it in a more valuable way uh, in terms of acquiring something that's going to help you. And it, it speaks to last year, the, the I think, schism between Tom Thibodeau and the front office. And I think, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to say that it's still there, but I know that there's some frustration in some corners of the organization about uh, reddish just being totally out right now and, and kind of being banished. And so, yeah, it just, I think if, if you're the Knicks, as Steph said, best case scenario is having can be part of a package for, uh, you know, a solid player, a solid pick, but sending him out on his own for a second rounder. Uh, I, I, that would be questionable to me if you look back at this thing from a 360 degree view. Um, but John, they, I will say this: if they, ahead, he, he is a free agent, so if you don't deal him now, you're going to lose him for nothing. Um, so there is a little bit of a time uh, timetable here, and there yes. is some pressure to do something. Absolutely, and I will always think that the Lakers will have a degree of interest in Cam Reddish because from Jump Street uh, specifically after the Knicks trade for Reddish and then prior to the trade deadline last year, they were very interested in Reddish. So I'm, I'm always going to believe that there's going to be some interest there. We'll see how it plays out. Let's talk about a Nick that's been on the court, Jonathan. Uh, Jalen Brunson, uh, obviously really strong game against San Antonio. Uh, your thoughts on where he is and what he's shown you so far? Um, my thoughts on where he is, is I'm, I'm just very thankful as someone who roots for this team that I get to root for this player and watch him, um, on a game to game basis. Like you could say a lot of stuff about the Knicks over the last 20, whatever it's been years. Um, but I think if there was one word to describe the franchise as a whole, it's instability. And I think if there's one thing that Jalen Brunson brings both on the court and from what I could tell, at least from my vantage point off the court as well is stability. And like I was looking up a stat earlier. I always got to bring some kind of stat when I come on the show. Um, he's had in, uh, I think he's played 35 or 36 games for the franchise. He's already had a dozen games where he scored uh, 20 points, uh, six assists, and over 50% uh, from the field. That number going back the last 25 years is already the fourth most in franchise history. It trails only Marbury, uh, who has a bunch, and then uh, Jamal Crawford and Raymond Felton, who both played a bunch more games than, than Brunson. He's just a stable point guard force that they really haven't had for a very long time. And I think you see it not only in what he does, but also his impact on Julius Randle. And I, I think a lot of credit to Randle's all-star campaign has to go to the stabilizing influence of Brunson. Yeah, I'm, I'm, here's a hot take. He is the best, for me, he's the best Knicks point guard uh, since Mark Jackson. That's that's going back 30 years. Um, and I'm including Marbury in there because um, – 
you know, Mar Marbury was obviously a more talented offensive player, but he did not bring, you mentioned the stability, he did not bring that, he did not bring the leadership and really the mentality to win um, in New York City that Jalen Brunson had brought to this team. Um, I, he, listen, I was one of the people that questioned his contract when he, when the Knicks signed him. Um, he's actually, he's proving his worth. And you look at that contract now and you're like, wow, that's a steal. Uh, that's, that's how much he's kind of convinced me. The Knicks paid for that playoffs playoff run that he had last year, and he's playing up to that level. Um, so you couldn't ask for anything more from Jalen Brunson right now. Yeah, I was just racking my brain. Uh, Steph, I can't come up with a good argument to your point, your hot take about Mark Jackson. I, I, he's right there, right? And you're not going to go Jeremy Lin. You're not going to go Ray Felton. I mean, yes, Brunson's right there. And the thing that strikes me too, and I, I don't know – how much of it is there, but it's just my sense is like he is he has a commitment to this organization on a different level than just you know wanting to be in New York, whatever it is, because of his ties to Leon Rose, his ties to Tom Thibodeau, his father being on the bench. And I, I don't know if that adds anything to what he gives them every day, but I, I just think there has to be something there where you know he he wants to succeed because it allows the, this group to succeed, the, the men I mentioned to succeed. And I think that there's something there where, you know, that's important to him. And you're seeing night in and night out his impact on the court, off the court. Players and Tom Thibodeau rave about the way he impacts the locker room and, and, and things off the floor. So, yeah, it certainly looks like a very, very valuable contract uh, at this point. And, and another guy who has really played well in his contract – Maybe if you're looking at it today, also looks pretty valuable as Julius Randle, which is yeah. surprising to say because um, of his ups and downs, a lot of downs last year. Uh, he's clearly, clearly playing really well right now. Um, Steph, you've watched every minute you've been around the team for him. Uh, what do you think is the key there to, to the way he's played recently? Uh, I think when he is happy and enjoys playing basketball, and is able to compartmentalize the negativity and put it in a different place. He, he's a, an elite talent. Um, he's a physical, um, great player. I mean, I think it's all about upstairs with him uh, and his three point shot. Those are the two things, and and they probably go hand in hand. And we 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 were talking earlier about Obi Toppin. I do wonder, and this is just theory. I do wonder about Obi Toppin being out and the crowd and not having to worry about the crowd chanting for Obi every single time Julius Randle struggles a little bit. Um, and not and Julius not having to look over his shoulder. I want, and he's played really well since obi has been out. I do wonder if that plays a factor. Um, and we'll see, well, maybe we'll see when Obi comes back, whether this, this continues. Um, but you know, he's just in a great place right now with his game, with his mentality and, he was able to the other night. He was able to finally like talk about that thumbs down thing in a joking manner, um, which uh, <laughs> I'm getting from him lately. And he talked earlier in the season. He talked about how he he struggled with with his relationship with referees last season, and he's been working on that. So everything you want to see from uh, Julius Randle, you've been able to see this season. Yeah, I, well said. I, I concur with all that, Doctor Bondi. <laughs> diagnosis on uh, on Julius. <laughs> Uh, we're going to go right now to Matt Spenley, who's got a fan question for us. Matt, what's happening? Gentlemen, how we doing? Fan question today is from Jeremy. Ian, when are the Mets going to sign Carlos Correa? Uh, sorry, I got my notes mixed up. Uh, <laughs> does this front office seriously believe in Julius Randle long term? So as you guys are talking about Julius and his mentality this year, and you guys have spent some time talking about Obi and his role what about the long term? What about the end of his contract as they look ahead? How do you think the team feels about him as a whole? Great question. And I think phrased well, because the front office is, is what really matters here. Uh, I, I know that talked about it before. Prior to the draft last year, there were I think there was more than cursory conversations about a deal involving Randall. Um, but ultimately, there was no buy in at the top of the Nick organization to pull the trigger on that deal. And, and that's why I've said since then that there's no, I don't see a deal happening where uh, the Knicks would just get off of Julius Randle. If he's traded, it's going to be a franchise altering deal where the Knicks are, are bringing back uh, players of equal value or whatever you want to say production. So it's not going to be some salary dump. And I think that, you know, 
people in touch with the Knicks, even recently, under the impression that the people at the top of the front office, you know, Leon Rose, William Wesley, uh, Brock Aller, Scott Perry, the whole group, I don't think there's any desire to trade Julius Randle, uh, and more specifically for a deal that just allows Obi Toppin to get more minutes or allows something else to open up. I don't think there's any appetite there at the moment. So the Knicks fans who are wondering about Julius's trade value as he can, continues to play well, I wouldn't hold your breath on any kind of Julius Randle trade unless it's a franchise-altering move, which would also surprise me uh, between now and the trade deadline. Ian, I don't – I mean, the way he's playing, he's legitimately in the all-star conversation. How How could you move him – for anything less than a star right. return. I, I don't know how you, I mean, forget about selling it to the fans. How do you sell that to your owner? Um, you know, right. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't even know how to ask that question. And then, you know, just as far as like what the front office thinks about him to me that, or really since the beginning of last year and last year starting to go downhill, um, that's been the biggest question for me hanging over the organization. And now that he's righted the ship in such a significant way, you know, it, to use another like uh, relationship analogy, it's like you, you break up with someone and then they say they've cleaned up their act. Do you do you believe them? You know, if they actually show some evidence and like, again, I have to go back to Brunson. How, how much does the fact that they have Jalen Brunson here, like does the front office look at that and say, OK, we believe that whatever was going on with Julius last year, he has this, uh, you know, this stabilizing influence now, as long as that player is next to him we feel confident moving forward that he's going to continue performing at least some approximation of this level. I mean, the dude had a chase down block last night against the Spurs. How many times could we remember Julius? Like, especially when it was a turnover that wasn't his fault and he busted his butt to get down there and, and swat that ball away. I mean, that, that was a, that's exactly what you want to see as a fan. And we didn't see that at all last year. I want to hear so, Steph uh, take on this. Yeah. Steph, I want to hear your take, bro. But, but Jonathan, I don't want to get personal, but you've made two references <laughs> to relationships. Is, is everything okay? If the misses on the home front, you guys good? Thankfully, yes. I am married to right, okay. uh, my best friend. She is wonderful. I have no complaints there. Um, Clip that for Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. All right, Steph, go ahead. Uh, so I want to be clear. I'm not advocating for a trade of Julius Randle. I never wanted to trade Julius Randle. But here's why you might be able to justify it right now. Um, he has obviously been up and down in his career. Um, we saw what happens when he gets frustrated last season. We saw how far, how low he can get after such a great all NBA season the, in the, during the pandemic. And if you're going to trade him and you have him on four years, if you have him on four year deal, you trade him while the value is high. And right now it's high. Um, and I think that would be the only reason you could even entertain the idea. Of course, the Knicks aren't going to do that. They're playing really well. They're the sixth seed right now. Um, but I, I'm, I do, I admit, I am skeptical that Julius Randle is going to be able to keep up this kind of production for the uh, for the long haul. And if you are going to move in a different direction, now would be the best time because you're going to get something back that you won't get back later. That would be the only reason why it makes sense. And look, I think Steph, the also just thinking about management. I mean, obviously there are close ties between Leon Rose, William Wesley, Julius Randle. Um, but even beyond that, you know, I think for them, if they continue this, right, just 500, a couple games over 500, competence, uh, no long, brutal losing streaks, no no string of embarrassing losses. I think everybody, you know, is going to be. Uh, fine from a from a job safety standpoint, and I think they'll get you know another off season, another season to con continue to try to build this thing out. That's why any kind of major trade, as long as the Knicks continue a pace here, any major trade where you're totally shaking up the roster ahead of that February deadline uh, would surprise me because I think the the goal was to show you're taking a step forward, show confidence. And as long as they do that, there's not going to be any anybody on the hot seat. You need to get another another go here in the all season. Yeah, and that's important. I, I know a lot of fans want to see either you are at the top and competing, or you're at the bottom and you're tanking for a high draft pick. And those are because being stuck in the middle is the worst place. But the Knicks need to show that they that they're a competent organization that they can make the playoffs. I think a, a step in the right direction is getting into the sixth seed, not you know avoiding the play in. And then you take it from there. I think that is an important step in progressing as an organization. 
And keeping Julius Randle is something towards that goal. And I think that's the way they should go and the way they will go. Yeah, and everything that I know, uh, making the playoffs is a goal for owner James Dolan. It always is. And I think, you know, you can see why both financially and from a prestige standpoint that that would be a goal. So it's just uh, it's something to keep in mind as you're thinking about big picture uh, items with this club. And now we have Matt Spenley yet again. Another fan question comment. Fellas, the fans are upset and think you're overlooking Stefan Marbury when we're talking about the best Knicks point guards. I know you brought him up earlier, and I'm just the messenger, but people are upset. So you have the floor. Stefan Marbury, they're saying he's an all-star. Jalen's not. Let's hear it. You want to talk New York City point guards? Stefan Marbury's right up there with everybody. I mean, in my opinion, uh, everybody. And I think Rod Strickland underrated there. And maybe you want to go Knicks guards, even though he had a cup of coffee with the Knicks. He's very, very good. Um, but it, Jalen Brunson, I, Steph hit on it all. It's it's more about the connectivity, the stability, the uh, culture building, I think, than it is uh, a skill level. Because skill level, obviously, Stephon Marbury uh, is ahead of Jalen Brunson. But you look at the intangibles and what he's brought to the table, Jalen Brunson, over the first couple months, over his first couple months as a Nick. And, yeah, I'm, I'm with Bondi. I think it's a hot take that is not even that hot. Yeah. And I, I'll guarantee you this. You will never see Jalen Brunson eating Vaseline. <laughs> Someone did say that in the comments, too. That was brought up in the comments. <laughs> All right. Can we also just really quick with Marbury, when you're trying to, like, divorce the, you know, the dysfunction of the organization at that time from whether he should have done more to overcome that or whether he contributed? Nope, I think we lost John. In the I middle. think I think Definitely. we lost John there, but I, I do I want to say just one thing. Uh, I thought the way that Stefan Marbury ended his career in China, I mean, it's one of the more remarkable like career turns that at least I've seen in, in pro sports. So I, I want I know there was a lot of craziness with the Knicks, the Vaseline, everything. Uh, but the way he ended up in China and just embraced it and he was embraced. I thought really, really impressive. Uh, but anyway. Enough about Nick history. Uh, Steph, as you're looking ahead here, you know, Toronto, the rest of the month, it gets a little tricky. Um, and you have RJ Barrett coming back. What do you think is a realistic projection for this group over the next 15 games? Um, I think, listen, I, I had them before the season started, I had them in a 500 team. Um, they're, I think J Jalen Brunson has exceeded my expectations. Um, Julius Randle has exceeded my expectations. I think from enough of what I've seen here with Tom Thibodeau uh, finding something with this nine-man rotation, as long as they maintain the health, and I know R.J. Barrett's out, he's coming back, he's going to help them, uh, and it's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a long-term injury. He's coming back soon. As long as they maintain their health, um, I think they're going to hover, you know, around that area of five games over 500 to, you know to six games over 500, and I think that's a win for them. I think that's that's a good place to be in the Eastern Conference. The Eastern Conference is really stacked right now. It's a, it's a tough place to be. Finally, we after years of calling it the Eastern Conference, I think it's Western Conference right now. So, um, you know, I, I, I see them kind of maintaining where they are right now, and that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I think getting to, you know, when they were briefly, I guess, at 18 and 13, that was probably a little fool's gold. Um, I see the same thing that you just said, Steph, uh, you know, three, maybe four games over 500 would be a, a nice high watermark moving forward from here. Um, I, I think just like the important thing for me, I'm not so concerned about whether they could beat the best teams in the league. If you steal one or two, great. If not, no big deal, but win some of these games against the other teams in the middle of the pack. You know, and they've done a nice job of that at times, some other times, you know, not as good. If you could win a, enough of those, I think you'll be OK. And I think you could get to the finish line with whether it's 42, 43, 44 wins, something in that range. That would be, I think, a really, really nice season for them. We ourselves are at the finish line right now. Uh, Steph, Daily News, always appreciate you coming on. Jonathan, Nick Film School, always appreciate you coming on. Thank you a lot, fellas. We will be back with you guys next Thursday at 1 p.m. for another episode of The Putback, and we'll see you then.